Welcome to the October meeting of the Rockwell Collins Amateur Radio Club. Yes. Um, we'll go around with introductions. So if you hear somebody on the repeater and you say, who is that guy? Listen for his call. Then when you come to the meeting, you'll be able to figure out, ah, that's the guy. So I'm Charlie, KC0CD. Tom, KD0HF. Jack, WA0KNM. I'm Don, I got a license. No equipment. It's KD0VQC. Very good. Brent, KD0 FX Day. Al, KA0IES. Mike, KE0DOB. Larry, AB0QS. Gary, K0GT. Joe, WB0YFL. Mark, KHXK. Vince, N2AIE. Kim, WB6QBK. Dave, W-A-9-H-B-C. Aaron, A-0-I-O-N. Rolf, K-D-0-S-O-Golf, Delta. Y-N-A-C-0-R-I. Rolf, K-D-0-O-D-A-S. I'm Larry, K-D-0-O-U-T-M. Vince, K-I-6-A-S-W. I'm Anthony, A-D-W. I'm Larry, also. Bill, AD0GS. Mike, AC0HD. Bob, KD0CQF. Steve, NA0IA. Bob, KD0O. Barry, W0LIY. Steve, K9NG. Bill, N0LIML. Ross, AD0EH. And Brian, KD0YSQ. Okay. Uh, Brian has a few things to uh, make, some announcements about here. Okay, if I need to pass this around, I'll come stand by Charlie. I'm going to pass this around. Uh, it's sorted by yes, you're signed up, and no, you're not signed up. Okay, and so if you think you are, you're not in my database. If you think you should be, there's a pile of paper over here, and we'd be happy to accept your $20. I would like you very much to check your email addresses because that's pretty much the only way we're communicating with people these days. So uh, pass it around, make sure that the date is right, make sure that you're paid if you think you're paid, and there you go. And for treasurer's report, thank you, sir. See there, just like that. Right. For treasurer's report, we got 11,800 something. 892.45. Thank you much. And uh, 52 plus. Maybe 10 or 15 so far today. Yes. There you go. Members, right. Members. Is that minus the uh, tower work? Or have we sorted that out? We haven't sorted that out, and I suspect we won't be charged for it. We don't Because know. we're after over past the fiscal. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, that's, that's the thought, is that uh, it, it, got it got charged on, under the wrong thing in SAP, and nothing was delivered. Oh, yeah. So because of that, Rockwell says, well, there's nothing been delivered, so we're not going to pay. And because of that, it laid fallow. And finally, uh, the guys from Tri-State got a hold of Mike and said, are you guys going to pay us? And he said, well, you haven't been paid. And so he went back and stirred that pot, and that was three weeks ago. And so now it's the next fiscal year, so we don't know what's, um, how that's going to all play out. But we haven't gotten a bill for it. So we think that we missed the bullet. Don't ask a question you don't want an answer to. Okay, um, October is officer election month. Uh, oh, as listed on there, if you want access to the club stations as a retiree, um, you know, you gotta fill out the paperwork and then we submit it to the, to the security and they'll put you on the list. You just go to the, one of the two stations, uh, uh, guard stations, uh, 105 Southwest or Entrance 1. Those are, have guards there at all, all the time, and they'll give you a restricted badge so you can go to the station. Works out pretty well. You just have to walk through the company. Anyway, so uh, October is Officer Election Month. So, anybody want to volunteer to take one of these guys' place? 
crickets. And you're welcome to any of them, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, in the, in the military, everybody else steps back and you're out there, what, what, no. <laughs> it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> okay, new stuff around the station, what can be done? Um, one thing, uh, we, we try to have some kind of an event every couple years because people like talking to W0CXX, Art Collins's, and uh, call. So I don't know what this can be an an anniversary of, but um, it would certainly be nice now that we have antennas down at Main Plant and HF antennas at the North Plant Station, we could certainly uh, work up a nice event that uh, if anybody could come up with an idea, doesn't have to be huge, you know. What we did the last time was, what, two years ago? Um, where we had it for a week, so it wasn't one day. So if you contacted the station any time during the week, you got, you know, the plaque or whatever we had, the QSL card. Um, <clears throat> and the beauty of that is, I mean, if you can't make it in there on a Saturday when, wouldn't we say that's when it's going to happen, then you're out of, you're left out. If we have it for a week, then you know, you can make it in there, operate for a couple hours. Um, and some of the new equipment. So, this is what is currently the um, um, uh, suckers, or whatever. Um, okay, what's happening at the North Station? The new Flex 5 6500 is installed and ready to use. I'll give you a quickie rundown on that here in a moment. The D-Star coax was whatever some animal or it just rotted away or whatever. So that was one of the problems with the D-Star. It seems to be quite a bit more solid. I was on the Saturday night net, which is hooked to 60 or 53A, I believe. So it worked very well. So if you got a D-Star radio, turn the thing on and listen in. It works. Uh, the whisper station is working most of the time. Uh, all the radios are up, all the antennas are up come and use the station. If you are interested and would like to have a look at it, I can go over right after this meeting and we can walk through that thing and I'll give you a demo of this new radio here. Um, what needs to be done, there's a, the S line has a transmitter problem, it doesn't work. Receiver tuning got a little bit of backlash in it. Um, so that's, you know, if you want to help, we got stuff to do. Now, over at 112, we've got uh, power pole connectors and BNCs and in connectors and some zip line, uh, scope probes, wide selection of ICs. Somebody years ago sorted them all out. So if you're interested in, see, there's, there's the uh, Anderson power poles and the connectors and the, the fancy crimper. Those are all available as a club member to use those. Now the, the, the magic happens back here, put a little note in there, how many you took, so I had no, have an idea how many to buy to replace them, and uh, put the money in that can, all right? So, for the Flex 6500, uh, the only place I could find to put the computer was under the desk, the, the operating desk. So straight above this is the uh, HF380 above the bench. So if you look under there, you got to turn that on first. That's step one. And then when the computer gets up, you don't click on the DAX or the uh, smart SDR over here. These are the interfaces of the cat and the DAX is very interesting. There's four totally separate receivers in this radio. And so you can direct who they go to. And so you click on the smart SDR, and then this comes up. It may take a little bit after you turn, oh, and then you got to turn on the button on the front and turn the power on, on the uh, 6500, and then it'll show up right here. And you click on that, and then down here in the corner it says connect. And then bam, you're on. Well, I had this thing running at home just to get the computer talking to it and load all the software. And I didn't get anything like this. So when I got in there and hooked it up, and I said, holy smoke, I gotta work on my antenna. This thing's really picking stuff up and 
Then I started looking at it and I realized it was the Ritty contest. <laughs> Normally you never hear anybody on Ritty, maybe one or two, but Land Negotiation, it took over the whole digital portion, just brrr, and they were really talking. So um, it's a fun radio. Come in and use it. I'll check you out on it. Or you can get Al Groff, he's, he's the expert. He didn't come tonight. Okay, next. This is interesting because you have a waterfall. I opened the thing up, so it's uh, here. You know, it's about the same, well, the top was bigger. But I noticed this here. Now, I don't, this, you wouldn't see this on a regular radio. But this says that the uh, fading starts low and moves high. And my brother looked at that and he says, you know, that means the atmosphere has a Q of about 45,000. To have something that's 200 hertz wide at uh, 9 meg. That's an AM signal. But that's the way fading is. It isn't, you can see some of the stripes that go horizontally, that's a blast. Uh, so something caused it. When it's blue, it's, you know, you're, you're at the noise level. The deeper, the brighter the color, the stronger the signal. So you can see the carrier going up the middle. And there are a couple spots where the carrier went away. But it goes, moves across the band, which kind of fits with that whole fading idea of circular and all that stuff. I just thought that was interesting. One of the things you see, get to see on the flex radio. Now, moving ahead. Maybe I should show these slides after we get the demo on the... Uh, but... We'll have the vote after the talk, okay? Here's the deal. This one, the, it is the 9100 you recommend, right? Okay. So, this is the ICOM 9100. What we currently have is an old... Yesu? Yes, 726R. Yes. Um, it's, it's missing parts. It's 30 years old and uh, rather difficult unless you're... <laughs> good <laughs> to, to get on the actual satellites. This one is a whole lot easier to actually get on the satellite. So, here's the problem. Uh, I just grabbed some of the reviews off Eham. This guy gave it a 4 out of 5 because he didn't like the position of something. But this guy just thought it was the greatest thing since uh, Jell-O. Um, what he didn't like, he has a pretty good list here, but none of them are killers. He still gave it a five. Uh, the pain is it's a new radio. So we're looking at that, um, about $2,900. Uh, it also, by the by, is a D-Star radio. So for $158 or so, we can make it talk D-Star. Okay, uh, so think about that. After the talk, we'll have a vote. Do we want to do this? Okay, do we buy it? Discussion, questions, we'll do that afterwards. Okay, main plan. Oh, Mike is not here. He's not feeling well. Okay, all the antennas are up and operational. We've got a four element step IR down there and it really works well, especially when it's hooked to the uh, alpha. 1,500 watts, people hear you. <clears throat> um, okay, one thing that um, about uh, here, this. In the old rotor, you had bolts here that you would <clears throat> screw into it and it would pinch on the mast. Well, we have a molybdenum mast, so it doesn't bend, but you can't squeeze it hard enough. It's like glass. So... My suggestion is before the snow start, and it slips, so it's only squeezing pressure on the side of this glass-like mast. So my thought was to get some anti-skid. Um, well, you don't see it here, but you see it on steps. You know, it's got sandpaper on one side and sticky on the other side. Take that off and put a couple strips of it on and clamp it back on. We originally thought of taking this plate and welding a nut on here and here and here and here and then driving a, uh, a screw into it. 
just to give it some points to bind on. To do that, we, ha we have to take that plate down, though. So there'd be a time where there is no, nothing to hold the thing. How about like inner tube, just a rubber? You mean around it to pinch it? Mm, yeah, well, that's... So it's, it's yes. Yeah. Yes. What about a bore and a couple of holes clear through that bore? Well, that's what this hole is. But you do the. You mentioned that the guys that produce those that molybdenum pipe, and they says it's so hard that'll cause it to shatter if it really twists on it. Yes. Do you have much room above that bracket? If so, you could bolt. You could create an additional bracket with a couple of uh, legs that come down and mount on those existing uh, bolts. And True. You it on, and then you, you have maybe double or three times. The area of friction, that's true. But you also probably want to put in what you're talking about is something extra sticky to again grab between your additional bracket right. and, and, and the pole. Well, if there were some sharp edges, I don't know, uh, concentrate the, uh, the pressure to some points rather than flat like this. So that's, that's the problem with that. Um, the, uh, the satellite beams and low noise amps are up and operational. We have a four by three foot as muthal map mounted on the cork board, centered on Cedar Rapids. So you know exactly where it's heading to point at, except the, the beam has slipped so it's not exact, the meter isn't telling you exactly what it's pointed at. So we've got a note that gives you a correction. Oh, yes, right. That you can update, too. Right, right. You should take a peek at the end. Oh, yeah, we're pointed northwest, and you go inside and it says northeast. Oh, okay, let's see, I want to take 90 degrees out of it. Is that after revision control? <laughs> not very much. Okay, and then Wednesday night he meets from 4.30 to 7. You know, there's stuff to do. He's interested in getting the uh, 51J4 up and running. So, and there's always cleaning up to do. There's stuff falling out of the cabinets and things that could be 5S. Okay, so the restoration for the 233 continues. Um, I've been over there when I've been given tours through the museum and there, the, the problem, if you haven't been following this, is we split the cost of this with the museum uh, several years ago and they've got it to the point where the tubes glow and I've noticed with several uh, pieces of rock of Collins equipment he liked the idea of having glass so you can see the glow of the tubes the tubes on this side on the left side are uh, uh, rectifier um, mercury vapor so they glow nice and purple <laughs> And I think they modulate when you start drawing a lot of current out of them. But, um, so they've got it that far, but transformers, as they start using them, get hot and the, and the magic grease falls out on the floor and they get let out the smoke. And, and so they're slowly bringing things up, but the schematics they have, I, I think they passed each other in the hall sometime in the past is about as close as they correlate with reality. So they're working schematics at the same time they're trying to figure out what it really does and stuff. So if you're interested in working on some heavy iron, um, contact uh, Jim Jones or, or Mike Heineck. All right, and I think that kind of covers the thing. So let me go back there and switch. Any, any questions on that much? Is the, right yes. Uh, regarding the new satellite radio, is that, going to match up with your satellite beams down on main plant? Or oh, no, no, it'll be down at main plant. Okay. And the software we have, or will have, will control the radio and the satellite. Which is kind of cool. Okay, now we park this one. Now wait, 
You're going to be recorded. And recorded for posterity. So this one makes sure. Yes, that, that one is for hearing here. No, yeah, okay, and then that one is. Uh, so one of them is recorded on the one's here, video. One of them's YouTube. Uh, yeah. Uh, how close we gotta get these? Yeah. Testing, testing. And like that. Hello. Now this is forward and backwards, and it's a laser. So that's how that works. All right. All right, everybody here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, thanks. I'm Vince Vela. Um, I'm down at Government Systems and Main Plant, uh, KI6 ASW. I've also got. Um, Wyatt here is going to do a live demo. So logistics wise, I don't know if we want to do the, the vote before the demo because I'm going to go through kind of just a background of using amateur radio with satellites. Then we're going to have a demo on what was it, 619 pass? So about 10, 10 15 minutes worth of a pass of an actual uh, low Earth orbit satellite that Wyatt is going to work mobile um, just to show kind of proof of concept how it works. So uh, logistics wise, I'll try to wrap up, I guess, uh, around 6, uh, 10, maybe even a little earlier than that, so that I give time to get out towards, you're going to demo at your, your vehicle, right? Oh, yeah, I can go anywhere. Or you want to bring it here? I can bring it right there. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we'll still plan to wrap up about 10 minutes before and then go out there and we can watch that. There's also an ISS pass that may or may not be visible. Um, all right, so hands in space. I had to grab a picture of the, the chimpanzee. His name was Ham. He went into space. He came back successfully, lived a nice long life until the uh, 1980s. Um, all right, so ham radio. What do we do if we want a lot of coverage? Well, we, uh, we set up a repeater, right? So we find the highest tower we can find or say this nice, beautiful mountain that I used to see from my backyard at my old QTH and we set the radios up as high as possible. Um, that actually works quite well, except for that we have free space path loss. I'm not sure why it's rendering incorrectly there, but uh, we've got a uh, R squared, inverse R squared um, power problem here, and, and hopefully that's not new news to anybody. Um, it, it still works pretty well, unless the tower's too darn close. At my new QTH, uh, this tower is literally three quarters of a mile out, so I actually have to use filters, but I'm just griping and off topic at this point. Um, basic geometry, we can actually calculate how far and what the look angles will be just using, uh, you know, trigonometry and formulas, knowing how high the uh, tower is. But kind of as we know, higher is, is pretty much better. Um, in fact, I, I went ahead and looked at how high and how far we can go, and on the right, map kind of Earth versus a couple of different antenna heights, and then looked at um, the nice circular coverage that you could see. So the Earth is curved, and at some point the signal actually starts to fall off, and, and you lose it. Hey, Alan. <laughs> so, so at some point you start to lose the coverage, um, and you start to fall off. And, and actually up on the upper left here is a terrestrial tower. It's actually the, the WEX station uh, here for Cedar Rapids, and you see the nice little circular coverage. Uh, and I exaggerated the scale as if that coverage area was in green, and then did the same kind of trigonometry for a, a typical low Earth, uh, Earth orbit satellite where the uh, tower would be quite a bit higher, and then showed you that the corresponding coverage is quite a bit more as well. Uh, I don't think this is mind-boggling to anybody. Um, in fact, clear back uh, 100 plus years ago, Newton had a thought experiment in the Principia that said uh, if you could shoot a cannon, it would come up and it would go down, follow the curved path. We kind of all know that from playing ball when we were kids. You did a little bit further and the curvature gets a little bit more gradual. At some point, the curvature is going to match the curvature of the Earth. And if there weren't other forces to slow it down, it would continue to just keep falling around the Earth and return to where it started. Uh, a couple hundred years later, in 1957, that became a reality, and rockets actually provided the thrust that uh, was necessary to get above the air that would slow the cannonball or satellite down and, uh, and actually give it the speed required to do that. And then there are, unfortunately, all these are rendering incorrectly. They, they showed up okay on my computer, but um, 
basic math, and I know that we don't do math in public, so I'm not going to walk through all of this, but, uh, <laughs> but basic fundamentals is pretty simple. We have Newton's law of gravity on the left there. We have centripetal force on the right, and we need to balance the two, the inward force versus the outward force. And if we do that, lo and behold, we can calculate a velocity. Once we know velocity and we know how high the satellite is, then we know how far it has to go. We can divide by the velocity and we can calculate an orbital period. I actually just went out to a website and grabbed a predict for the International Space Station and just eyeballing it, 704 to 641, it takes about one and a half hours, right? And then I can calculate a velocity must be somewhere in the neighborhood of 16,600 miles per hour for that orbit. Or I can formally go through all of this derivation get a formula that shows me that the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis, and if you remember physics way back when, that's Kepler's third law. Plug in all the numbers, and lo and behold, we get the exact same answer, which is kind of cool. Um, so wait a minute, then how fast it's too fast, we can keep playing this game, and we can actually say, if we took a particle from way out in space, nothing's perturbing it, and slowly let it just start to fall in the Earth, and it goes faster and faster and faster, it'll impact the Earth at a certain speed. And uh, that, the addition of basically the potential energy that it hasn't gained, plus the kinetic energy that it has gained, is called the Hamiltonian of the system. And we can set the two equivalent to each other and back out again another velocity, which is actually the escape velocity, which tells me if at the surface of the Earth, I can boost something to 11.2 kilometers per second or 25,000 miles per hour. That particle will never come back ever. It, it won't go into orbit. It'll escape the Earth. Uh, it'll go into orbit around the sun. Um, so a few more background things. Um, okay, so Kepler's laws. We already saw Kepler's third law, which is a consequence of Kepler's second law, which was just illustrated there. Satellite, as it's moving, will sweep out equal areas. So if it goes further away, it's got to slow down. And as it gets closer, it has to speed up. Uh, as a result, our geosynchronous satellites are clear out here, like 6.6 .6 Earth radiuses away, or you know, uh, some 23,000 miles away, versus low Earth orbit. You know, they're only uh, four, maybe 700 uh, miles away. And so the geosynchronous orbit, as we know, takes 24 hours to go around, just like the Earth takes 24 hours to go around, and everything seems to just line up and stop. And we can point the satellite dish, or these low Earth orbit. Uh, satellites actually move at that one and a half hour period that we calculated on the previous slide and uh, remember that free space path loss so there's a reason to favor either one of these. These are great for a lot of wide coverage but usually you've got a dedicated dish. For amateur radio equipment usually we have low earth orbit satellites. Um, you can go ahead and actually describe all of these orbits by just looking at the fact that Kepler's first law says that an orbit is an ellipse with the parent body at one of the focal points, so now we've got a formula, and then we just need to give a couple of parameters. It actually only takes six of them. How close are we in the closest point? How far away are we at the furthest point, or eccentricity, which is kind of the same thing? Then we need to talk about how tilted it is. This is um, a highly inclined orbit, you know, so that's called inclination. That's the tilt, or you can tilt it the other way, and that would change sort of your um, longitude of the ascending node, which is basically where does the satellite rise? And then you also can change the entire yaw, if you will, so that if this thing wasn't pointing out that way, it was pointing kind of behind the screen. So there's five. And then we just need to talk about where the satellite is or the true anomaly of the satellite. So you can pack all of that information into something called a two-line element set and very succinctly uh, describe the orbit of a satellite. And then for all time uh, being two weeks until they go stale and you have to get a new updated one, calculate the orbit of a satellite. And so these TLEs are available online, and in fact, our uh, computer grabs these automatically down at main plant and, and calculates for us what the orbit should be. So then if we want to stop and look at the actual gra ground tracks, that's what we care about. When can we actually see this satellite? So here again, we have kind of our tower in space and what we can see. There's a couple things that we can say. If the satellite was up there and Earth wasn't moving and there were no other forces on it, thing would just go and come back and never change, kind of like the red dotted line that I've drawn here. But remember, the Earth is spinning. You know, the sun sets, the sun rises. And so we actually have some motion that we have to deal with. The orbit is slightly tilted because of that. And not only that, it actually moves or precesses, you know, over time. 
And so what will happen is it takes about 15 minutes or so for most of these satellites, if we go back and look at the hour and a half orbit, we could figure that out, to go from horizon to horizon. So if we're here, we just start to see it and then it comes over and we'd finally see it right there, depending on what its speed was. It takes about 15 minutes. Then when it goes around the other side of the Earth, it's got to go all the way around here where we can't see it, all the way around, all the way back and come back again. And that takes more like an hour and a half. Okay. So if you consider that the Earth is going to do one full revolution on its axis per day, makes sense, right? Because the sun's going to rise again tomorrow, 360 degrees divided by 24 hours in a day, means that we're moving 15 degrees per hour. So uh, an hour and a half, these things have moved quite a bit. They've moved a good 20 degrees over. So what that means is that you'll get a good pass, you'll get another good pass, you might even get a third or fourth pass, but at some point you're not going to be able to see the satellite again as this footprint continues to wander westward, 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 finally comes around, and then many hours later finally comes back and repeats again. Um, as a couple of practical considerations uh, that I think I put on the next slide here. So a couple of rules of thumbs when you're going to work satellite. And this is one of the reasons that I actually love it for ham radio is every pass is a little bit different. Okay, so you know, depending on where that thing is, has crept over to and depending on what the actual orbital parameters of that satellite orbit was to begin with, all of these passes are going to be completely different. And they all give you a little bit different DX possibilities depending on what you can work and see. If somebody else is in that footprint, then generally you can talk to them. And so that's kind of a, kind of a cool thing that uh, physics in action here. Um, the apparent motion itself is going to change with the geometry. So depending where you are in that footprint and what the satellite's doing to you, it may not pass overhead to you. It may instead just appear to barely crest the horizon, float there a little bit while it climbs, and then <coughs> set again. Be a very low angle pass, but some of those are the coolest passes actually. Um, counter to that, ones that go directly overhead are very rare. You can actually do the calculations to show that that's, that's an extremely rare mathematical occurrence that a satellite is going to go directly overhead. When it does, if you think about it, the satellite will raise, be rising and kind of not be moving towards you the way you're looking at it. It's actually climbing the limb of the earth. Then it'll start to kind of point towards you and start shifting towards you really fast. And we've got a slide on Doppler, but I'm sure you've already guessed the plot there. You've got to really worry about Doppler on these things. On the other hand, when it's overhead, it's going through less uh, than you know, a fourth of what it has to do to, on the horizon in terms of coming through the atmosphere. So think of trying to dive down and touch the drain down at the bottom of a swimming pool. You would go directly above the drain and aim for it. You wouldn't go over to the shallow end and come in at a shallow angle, right? Same thing with the satellite. There's a lot more attenuation for these low passes. So these kind of rare ones are actually kind of exciting too when you see it. And then remember this, how it creeps and then Another 12 hours later, it's crept around and the passes repeat. Well, that usually means that they're generally symmetric pairs with these passes. So if you get a really good pass at, say, 7 o'clock at night, go check out the future predictions because a lot of times you'll have another really good pass at, like, 7 in the morning, too. So um, I think that's kind of interesting. Let's see here. And then, actually, the orbit um, types, if you are interested in what these satellites actually do, it's kind of the reason I'm here because Rockwell Collins is building radios to work with satellites that I used to work on previously. And uh, so we actually build radios for these things and, and still use them. Um, you can actually kind of figure out the mission. So like I said, the um, geosynchronous satellites that appear to not move are great because you get a third or m such of the Earth's coverage at a tower that high. And it doesn't move at all. So that's great for communication. The problem is, is you're so far away and that path loss is so bad, it's not so great for something like um, imaging. So if you have a recon satellite up there or a weather satellite up there, you want to get a lot closer. And so just seeing what kind of orbit that you're looking at can kind of hint at what the satellite itself is doing. There are a certain special class of them called sun synchronous. And this is actually one of the cooler things that um, you can find out is that because the Earth is not perfectly spherical, it's kind of a squashed sphere because it's turning. There's a little bit of force and a bulge at the equator. 
it induces a torque on the satellite's orbit and actually makes the orbit itself change. Even though the, so the Earth is moving, the orbit is also moving. And you can tune how fast that thing moves based on that inclination, how tilted it was again. And if you tune it just right, the orbit will move at the same rate that the sun appears to move because we are going around the sun. So that's called a sun synchronous orbit. And the cool thing about that is you're coming up at the same local solar time, even though the, the time of the ascending pass changes. And you can see the changes in uh, shadow lengths, for example. Now, it shouldn't have changed if nothing had moved. So you can spot things that have moved really quickly with the sun synchronous satellite or weather um, satellites. You might want the certain amount of solar energy to have impacted the Earth uh, and normalize that out, right? So you don't want the satellite coming over two hours later than it did before. And so that's kind of a neat thing. You'll almost never find a satellite that actually travels from the east to the west directly. And if you think about it, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Well, that's because the Earth is actually going the other direction, right? So when you go to launch, if you get close to the equator, you get a ton of this energy, this uh, speed for free. You don't want to fight that. And so that's why you'll very rarely see that kind of a case. Um, here are a couple of example footprints that I grabbed off of a tracking website called n2io.com. So you can go here, and it'll determine where you are based on your IP address. So as long as you're not uh, doing something to change that, then you get reasonable predictions anyways. There are actually much better uh, programs. I think that, uh, in fact, Wyatt recommended that PC32 for us, so we'll use that in main plant. But I just grabbed these um, as a re recommended or representative example. What we have here is an ISS pass about two days ago. It was one of these very nice uh, high elevation ones going over our QTH here. You can see that the footprint is kind of spherical. Now think about that circle as it's going around the North Pole. It's still a circle on the North Pole, but now we plot it on the map. Well, at the North Pole, all around that pole is every degree of longitude, right? So there ends up being this huge distortion on high, um, highly inclined satellites as they get closer to the pole, which again is just another one of those neat things where you can go calculate for which paths are possible, which DX opportunities are possible. Um, on the right there is actually a NOAA Pose satellite, uh, NOAA 19. And the cool thing about NOAA 19 is that that's accessible to us ham operators. We don't transmit to it, but you can actually download uh, weather images that I've got a picture of later in this. Um, everything kind of has a footprint. Even geosynchronous satellites, they, they're actually kind of in motion because unless the um, orbit is perfectly circular, then it's getting a little bit further or a little bit closer just slightly. And as we saw, if you're further away, it slows down. And if you're closer, it speeds up because of that Kepler's third law thing. And so um, you'll actually see the satellite gain on us. And then um, we'll gain on it a little bit. And, and that'll happen over the course of a day. And if it's slightly inclined, then it actually ends up tracing out this figure eight as it goes throughout the day, which is kind of cool, too. OK, and I think this was the last slide of like background physics knowledge. But um, so again, the Doppler effect. Uh, so if you look at basically what we calculated, right, we saw velocities of 16,000 miles per hour. Depending on how we are relative to the satellite, we might get that full 16,000 miles per hour. We might get some small part of it. If we're sitting right here, we're not seeing any Doppler at all because we're perpendicular to its travel and, and it doesn't look like there's any distortion. If we're in front of it, we're going to get an increase in frequency. And if we're behind it, we're going to get a decrease in frequency. Um, if you look at it, 16,000 miles per hour is you know, some two and a half times 10 to the negative five parts of the speed of light itself. Or in other words, this would be a lousy oscillator. We've got errors more than one PPM in here. So um, Doppler is something that you actually have to tune for. It's actually something that you can see if you go and put up uh, like the Flex 500 PSD plot that Charlie is showing us. You can actually see the carrier move on these satellites as the pass proceeds. Um, it's not a huge effect. Uh, it's definitely more of an effect at a higher frequency, uh, 70 centimeters, for example, than at two meters. But even at two meters, you can see this. Oh, I lied. I had one more. So antenna polarization, right? Physically, the satellite might be 
pointing at the Earth. In fact, usually they are um, made to point at the Earth because they've got antennas and they want to point down beneath them. But what's down beneath them is constantly changing. So if you thought about a satellite pointing towards the Earth as it was over here, and then as it proceeded around, sorry, I went the other way. That was the way that would never happen east to west. But over here, physically, spatially, your antennas are not aligned. Okay, if that's a linearly polarized antenna and you've got a linearly polarized antenna, you're starting to get a range of uh, polarization cross mismatch, right? So cross polarization mismatch can be up to 20 dB. So typically for antennas, you're going to use circular polarization. And I brought in an antenna for object uh, lesson. This one I actually built, worked um, AO51 a number of times with this and a couple of other satellites. This is right-handed, circularly polarized. There's a cool story I always like to tell about this thing because electrical engineers and physicists didn't used to agree on how you would define what they call the neutrality or the uh, clockwise sense of this thing. So right-hand rule, you take this thing and look boresight and you wrap it around and you can see my hand is following the curvature of that so that's good that's right hand whereas left hand would be going completely opposite to it but it also makes sense perfect intuitive sense to be looking towards the antenna if you are the receiver not the transmitter so I forget which but one of them used to define the convention as left hand circular polarized was was right hand basically they got it backwards and um, in fact one of the engineering runs on one of the earlier satellites Telstar had a downlink in England and they had a downlink in France and uh, the, the English got it wrong and the French got the first reception in that engineering run off Telstar because they had it backwards. Um, so, and then there's another neat thing and this is like, so there's aspects of ham radio where we get on and we, we do emergency preparedness which is awesome or we get on and we have re relationships and we meet people and we tag up and that's awesome as well. But then there's also the pure science and the learning aspect of it and the Elmer and homebrew and stuff and that's stuff that always appealed to me. And um, you find out about something called the Faraday effect which is if I've got a linear um, antenna and I try to match the polarization uh, alignment spatially in space, I'll still get polarization fades and dropouts. Now, usually at two meters and even 70 centimeters, we don't have a lot of attenuation and um, uh, rain effects and stuff that affect the higher frequencies like direct TV drops out when it starts raining. That's not going to happen in the amateur radio side of things. But you're still going to have these huge polarization mismatches and it's due to something called the Faraday effect or Faraday rotation, which is um, actually basically a um, birefringent, the fact that there's a group, uh, a difference in group phase uh, depending on what orientation the EM part of the wave is going through. All another reason basically to say that uh, you take the 3dB hit even if the satellite has a linear polarized and you're going to use circular and you go with that instead of uh, dealing with cross uh, polarization mismatch. So I apologize again, uh, seem to render properly on the thing, but here, here would be an example link budget. All right, uh, I brought another thing, AMSAT, which I'll get to a little bit here. I think I had it. Uh, oh, here it is. AMSAT did a challenge coin thing where they were raising funds for one of our ham radio satellites up there, AO85, and they gave this little coin. This coin is of one fourth model of what that satellite is. It's actually, a, it's called a CubeSat. It's 10 centimeters cubed. So four centimeters on any given side, or I mean four inches on any given side. Um, you can actually go back and calculate the amount of maximum power that thing could get from the sun being that small covered with perfect solar panels. And when you run those numbers, it turns out to be actually surprisingly close to what these things actually output. Uh, five watts is a typical power from these satellites. So even with a ton of path loss in there, uh, we don't have a lot of power that we can usually pump into it. Bigger satellites, obviously, we can, but um, battery-powered and solar-powered trickle recharge, we only have so much we can deal with here. So you start out with that 7 dBW nominal. We go plug and chug in our path loss equation uh, for, in this case, I used uh, that uh, no oppose satellite uh, thing. And I used basically like uh, close to the two meter, yeah, 2.1. So I used our, our 145 uh, megahertz band that we use in amateur radio. Plug and chug and got uh, 154 dB worth of path loss. And then it's just a matter of collecting any of the other things that we have to deal with. I very 
overly estimated, maybe 5 dB due to the, just the sky, that polarization uh, mismatch, the attenuation, skinnulation as they call, like the ionosphere that we like so much down in the medium and long waves uh, can actually bounce things around up at higher frequencies even though it doesn't reflect them. Uh, maybe there's pointing errors with our antenna, we're not perfectly dead on, and then maybe we've got some antenna gain on the other hand to counteract that. We add up all the numbers, we consider that our receiver is not perfect and has a noise factor, and we take KTB. We know that we have maybe 25 kilohertz channel and uh, temperature is 300 Kelvin. Plug it all in and add it up, and we see that in this representative example, we have maybe a 3 dB signal noise ratio, so at least the numbers are <laughs> matching up for us. So quick plug while I transition from kind of the background and the physics side of it to the amateur radio and what can we actually do with this stuff. Um, AMSAT, so the Amateur Radio Satellite Corporation has been around since the 1960s. They launched the satellite AMSAT Oscar 1 in 1961. Um, they do a lot with hardly any budget. $40 a year, you become a member if you'd like, and you'll get a technical journal that comes out, I believe, quarterly. It's excellent, very technical, but also a lot of cool non-technical if you're interested into the other hobby side of things. In fact, Wyatt made like the, the honor list on there from winning a bunch of uh, contests in the AMSAT journal uh, a couple months back, or maybe it was a year ago now. But uh, um, So if you want to get involved, that would be the first stop, I think. I would highly recommend you go check out AMSAT. Um, these launches into space are quite expensive. I think on the other hand, they provide something that you don't get anywhere else, even with ham radios, is you have something that is outside the atmosphere, but still in the line of sight VHF frequencies, you know, that a tech class can actually have access to. You can learn a lot through this. Um, just looking at the physics like we calculated is, is one thing, and then actually working these satellites is another thing altogether. It's actually pretty cool when you uh, first capture these uh, satellites, you'll hear quieting as you actually hear the satellite's carrier. And so you've got your squelch wide open and you hear this hiss and then the hiss gets quieter. And you can't see anything most of the time. These are very small satellites, but you know it's there because if you point away, the hiss comes back really loud and you go back and you have it again. I, I just think there's a lot of neat stuff about it that are unique only to this platform. So what's actually up there then? Let's say we want to go up there, get away from the theory land and, and actually do this stuff. Well, there's a couple of easy FM foam satellites, just repeaters in the sky. I can just do narrow band FM on it. Um, AO85, which was just launched, the one I had the fourth scale model of. Um, Saudi, Saudi Sat Oscar 50, which was launched a long time ago, uh, is still up there. Um, there are a couple of future project Fox satellites that'll be a lot like this AO85, a CubeSat. They've got science payloads on them as well, actually. One of the science payload is going to be built uh, down at the University of Iowa, and they're going to have one of the, the Hawkeye's experiments in there, um, which is kind of cool because if, if you didn't know, you probably do, but um, Professor Van Allen, who is the Department of Physics and uh, Astronomy down at the University of Iowa, actually built the United States' first uh, satellite, Explorer 1, that found the Van Allen radiation belt. Um, so those are the easy birds, and you can kind of get on them. Nothing's easy about satellites. I should back up, right? When you've got a great satellite with a ton of gain and a huge, uh, you know, a great low noise figure preamp and preselector, then it's, it's fairly simple. But this, this is very weak stuff, right? I mean, 150 dB, 15 orders of magnitude of path loss right there. And so it's a challenge, and in, in actually that's part of what makes it cool at the same time, right? So, um, but easy is relative is, is what I'm saying. Then there are intermediate uh, satellites, this Fox Oscar 29, AO7, and then uh, AO73. What these guys are is they've just got a bandwidth uh, that they have assigned, and they come up one frequency, they translate it by a fixed amount and come down the other frequency. So if the bandwidth is wide enough, and usually there's, there's more than 25 kilohertz there, you can come up with a nice narrow modulation, single sideband or CW, what have you, and have multiple folks just doing sort of an FDM type of thing, okay? So, but you have to be a little bit more um, technical or at least experienced to be able to do that, right? Because those linear transponders are hard and you've got to shift, you've got to calculate your frequency offsets. Um, so, 
the reason I have A07 bolded and then asterisk, so there's a cool story about that satellite. It was launched in 1981. It was, uh, everything was going fine, but what they figured must have happened was it grew 10 whiskers. So in space, if you have dissimilar metals, you'll get um, all sorts of crystalline growth. You have it on Earth as well in the labs, but in space, nothing inhibits it from just growing huge tendrils like those rocks that you have, you know, they grow the crystals on or whatever. This thing grew a tin whisker and shorted out the battery and that was the end of the story. Or maybe, right? Because about five years ago, somebody reported hearing this satellite again and sure enough, there it was. When all they can figure has happened is finally that tin whisker burned itself out completely. The battery's dead, but when this thing is illuminated in the sun, you can still work through that satellite that's been up there since 1981. So kind of a cool side story. Um, and then there are a lot of that are just beacon or telemetry only, and depending on what you're interested in, there's educational opportunities up there. Um, I have examples of some of these where you can actually get housekeeping data from the satellite itself. It, it'll tell you how it's doing, how hot it is, how many times it's been around, how much power it's getting into its batteries, something like that. Um, a lot of times those are digital modes that if you're interested in the DSP side of the hobby, this is a great way to get a whole bunch of digital signals to play with. And then there are a couple that I would highlight of uh, just specific interest. These, uh, the International Space Station, of course, everybody knows that. Or hopefully, if you haven't seen it, this is one of the brightest satellites that you can see through a telescope. You can actually see structure on this satellite. It's so big. It's as big as a football field, and it's uh, 700 miles away or, so, or uh, 400 kilometers away. Um, it's also got a digipeter on there, and it's also got ham radio equipment for voice. And so sometimes uh, astronauts will talk to schools on the ground. You can listen in. Or if you wanted to get involved and actually help arrange some of that, you could provide the communications to allow that to happen, the equipment, I should say. Um, these NOAA POSE satellites, we can actually downlink in, in the VHF band, 137 megahertz, uh, a narrow band, 60K wide signal that's... Uh, there's software out there that you can just install and then you uh, record this thing and you get a weather image in real time. It's just relaying what it's seeing through its sensors right away. Uh, GPS, if you're interested in learning a little bit about modulation and coding theory. Um, so, but mostly how, how are we gonna do this? The majority of these things are what we call mode J or mode B in, in ham radio and the WARC has set these aside as satellite frequencies and mode J and B are just basically two meter, 70 centimeter offsets, transmit on one of them and receive on another one. They have other ones uh, planned actually, these phase threes will be like not low earth orbit ones but maybe geosynchronous or high, uh, high eccentricity ones so that they're not moving as fast. The, the one downside about it, and maybe it's a good thing, is that these passes are quick. You get, you know, 10 minutes to get your QSOs in. That's all you have. All right, Vince, do you want to talk a little bit about yeah, just, AO10? Just quickly, um, do you need the... Well, I, could you pass out the test? <laughs> <laughs> pass out the test for them because we're going to be going over some more of the math. Uh, no, not, not really. Because, like, <laughs> I had the opportunity in 1984 to operate Oscar 10 from the UK. I was G4WDF while I was there. And I didn't have much more than this. It was not so homebrew. It was a little dish and a fiberglass rod and some metal turns just like that. And two meters, just like what we have at the at the club. But Oscar 10 was a bit unique because they had some issues on the launch. And remember Vince talked about launching them from the equator. This guy was launched from French Guiana. 